So it's my pleasure today to tell you the, uh, a really exciting story that's unfolding in the field of uh, neurodegenerations and specifically in my field of uh, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. And uh, I'm going to talk to you about uh, the disease, about some of the molecular mechanisms, uh, and then uh, the uh, developments that are occurring in the field of anosense oligonucleotides, so you'll get an overview of how this uh, technology might be applied. Uh, so I'll just talk about a little bit about ALS and FTD, uh, about the uh, discovery in 2011 of the C9 ORF72 uh, ex ex uh, mutations and why that's uh, rocking the field, a little bit about the pathology mechanisms and then antisense. Uh, so the first thing I just want to make sure everybody understands is uh, a little bit about the disease ALS, which is similar to spinal muscular atrophy. It's an adult uh, idiopathic, usually idiopathic, uh, progressive neurodegenerations and patients will generally progress and then die within a period of about um, three, uh, three to five years. So the, it's a, a, a death sentence for most of the patients at variable rates of progression. Uh, over about the last 10 or 15 years, we've uh, clearly recognized the association with one of the uh, common forms of dementia, frontotemporal dementia, which is a progressive decline uh, of personality, character, um, language, social behaviors. So it's a unique uh, kind of dementia. And we realize now that both of these are on a, sp a spectrum. Uh, this just shows. Um, okay. Don't worry. Face me. Okay. Is that better? Uh, just a little bit about the anatomy of the motor system. Here's the upper motor neurons at the uh, cortex of the brain and then the spinal motor neurons. And it's a disease, ALS is a disease of, of both systems. And then this uh, frontal temporal dementia would be the frontal and temporal functions. Uh, the discovery, uh, and then this is the continuum uh, between the diseases um, uh, with some of the genetics of, gosh. I'll speak into this phone, uh, try to project myself. OK, so 10% uh, of ALS is um, genetic. And then there's a number of mutations. And some of the mutations are more likely to cause ALS, and some are more likely to cause a frontal temporal dementia. And the uh, mutation here, C9RF72, uh, is really equally positioned to cause either a dementia, uh, a dementia of ALS or an overlap syndrome. Uh, and this is what the uh, mutation was. It was found in a, a C9 ORF72, so it was a computationally predicted gene about which really nobody knew. It was in intronic location, so it was non-coding area. And it was this unique kind of mutation, which was an expansion. Uh, it's a hexanucleotide expansion, um, and it was huge in size. Normally, there's about under 20 to 30 uh, expansions in a normal uh, person, and then in the uh, patients, it's up to hundreds and thousands uh, in size. And this just shows the PCR and the um, uh, nucleic acid profile. Um, nobody really knows what the gene is, but there's a lot of efforts to try to understand it now. Uh, and then this shows just how significant the um, mutation is. So if 10% of ALS is genetic, uh, it accounts for 34%, so it's the major piece of the genetic patients. In sporadic ALS, uh, still they're misclassified, so up to about 6% of the patients um, of, of what we thought were sporadic will have the repeat expansion. And similar numbers will apply in uh, frontotemporal dementia. So it's really the single biggest uh, genetic uh, part of uh, both diseases. Uh, and then this is the spectrum of what are called the repeat expansion disorders, which is a large group uh, of uh, diseases which has, uh, for which there's been a, a great deal of progress over about uh, 15, 20 years, including some diseases like the spinal cerebellar atrophies, Friedrich's ataxia, some forms of muscular dystrophy, Huntington's disease. They are all characterized by uh, various uh, forms of repeat expansions. And this is where ALS and um, FTD will fit from C9. Okay, so this uh, shows um, what uh, are the immediately suggested mechanisms. So one possibility is that there is a um, that it causes some failure in the 
um, translation, transcription or translation of the gene, uh, which then leads to insufficiency. Uh, and the more immediate, um, for various reasons that was suggested, with, that it's a gain of toxicity. There's something in the expansion then that is toxic to the cell. And it, interestingly, it's either at the RNA level or at the, at the uh, peptide level. And so that's been a big uh, part of the activity is to unravel those mechanisms. Uh, now, if it's an insufficiency, uh, then uh, a strategy such as gene reduction with antisense oligonucleotides is not going to work. And so there's been a great deal of effort trying to look at what is the contribution to the loss of function. And uh, to summarize some pretty complicated data, most of the problems related to loss of function that's been discovered in mouse models have been really related to the immune system, and it hasn't caused any neurodegeneration. So there's a prevailing belief that reducing the gene in patients' nervous systems uh, is not going to be a toxic, create a, a, a problem so that we can proceed with uh, gene reduction therapy. Okay, now this shows uh, one, some of the complexity of what we're discovering. One is you have the sense strand here, which is coding for the uh, gene, and it's, it, you've got uh, both RNA products and you've got protein products. But to double the complexity of this, it turns out that the antisense strand, the, part, the strand that we thought was just stabilizing the DNA, turns out to be both transcriptionally and translationally active. So that we now have essentially double the number of toxic products uh, related um, uh, uh, to the mutation. And in particular, if we're going to target one of the um, strands, it, it's critical to know which is the toxic strand contributing to the, um, toxic, to the gain of toxicity. And this, I'm not going to um, go into detail, but this just shows uh, the proteins that are being translated. Uh, three of them are related to the sense transcription, three from anti-sense transcription, and this just shows uh, neurons, uh, immunohistochemistry showing uh, the, that all there's really five products because two of them are, come from the same, uh, the, the um, GP is both sense and antisense encoded. So in total there's five products and they all have different uh, deposits in the cytoplasm. Uh, and this um, slide shows what's turning out to be a really provocative discovery in the field. And that is that if you look at the cerebral spinal fluid of patients, uh, one of the products, GP, is actually elevated in patients with uh, the mutations. So that, for the f almost for the first time, gives us an actual measurable biomarker so that we can, as we move into therapies, can uh, begin to imagine that we can um, ascertain a target engagement. Um, okay, and this is just showing the um, uh, transcriptional products, the antisense uh, RNA, or the RNA foci, both from the antisense direction uh, and the sense direction, showing that there are deposits in the nuclei. And uh, so again, trying to understand whether, uh, how those might uh, uh, create toxicity. And this is just some work that we've, uh, that we're working on uh, getting published, having to do with evidence that's, that's looking like it's the antisense strand that might be more correlated with disease than the sense strand. So that's been, as I say, one of the big debates in the field. Um, and this is just a slide so that I can just say that we still don't really know that what the mechanisms of these toxic products may be. Uh, and so there's a whole lot to do to try to um, try to understand that. But one of the um, important things is that uh, to apply antisense oligonucleotide therapy, uh, we don't actually need to know what all the mechanisms are because we're going very upstream right to the transcription of the toxic strand. Uh, and so if we're inhibiting that, we don't actually have to know all the mechanisms which are then complicated and downstream. Okay, so I just want to um, now talk about what is this revolution in the antisense oligonucleotides. So we're traditionally in drug development used to talking about uh, receptors and ligands. Uh, and in a sense, now we're talking about that the RNA uh, and the 
Uh, the the uh, RNA and the uh, antisense oligonucleotide, which is uh, complementary to the target, then a in a sense act as if they're uh, receptors and ligands um, for therapy. Uh, it's uh, about a, a, a 15 to 20 nucleotide sequence gives us exquisite specificity uh, for the target. Uh, and it's a comple complex hybrid of DNA and RNA, um, and I'll show you the mechanism for that in a second. So this, again, just shows you how you're using, uh, with uh, medicinal stabilization, then you can stabilize the backbone of the uh, antisense. So it becomes your uh, delivery vehicle, and then your program, your sequence of uh, nucleotides then gives you your uh, specificity for the target. Uh, and with a lot of uh, development primarily, or the, the chief uh, development has just been at, at Ionis Pharmaceuticals in uh, Carlsbad, uh, has had decades to work on the medicinal chemistry, stabilizing the uh, delivery vehicles um, for these. Uh, and then this is how it works. So after administration, here's your antisense. Uh, here's your drug, your antisense oligonucleotides. Uh, it penetrates through the cytoplasm into the nucleus, where then it um, it has its uh, recognition. So when the uh, when the mutation when the mutated transcript um, is transcribed, there's recognition of the antisense uh, hybridization, um, and then through an endogenous mechanism of RNase H which will recognize it. It's recognized because of the hybrid between RNA and DNA. It's programmed to essentially um, uh, uh, eliminate that duplex. Uh, and so then, and in the process, uh, the, R, the transcript is taken out, uh, but the uh, antisense oligonucleotide is not. So it continues to police the cell. And uh, importantly, um, the duration of action of this is somewhere between one and three months. So if it's an effective therapy, uh, actually then uh, administration only needs to be done on a relatively uh, feasible schedule. It turns out that there's a, a number of different mechanisms by which this will work. Um, and there's a lot of different mechanisms, but some of them are the RNA-H mechanism where you're doing transcript reduction. Uh, in a parallel exciting story to what uh, Brian just told us about, um, it's actually being now approved for spinal muscular atrophy. So this um, tragic disease of infancy now has two transformative therapies that are being applied to it. And in the uh, spinal muscular atrophy, which I'm not going to uh, get into any further, there's an, um, uh, uh, um, it modulates the splicing into a very uh, intricate mechanism so that now that the cell is... Uh, tricked into making a competent protein with the backup SMN2 uh, gene. This just shows a little bit about the uh, delivery. You can see here the uh, subarachnoid space. This has to. This is not uh, delivered systemically, but intrathecally. But you can see the space that we have to work with is the uh, subarachnoid space and the intraventricular space. This just shows it in the three dimensions, and how if we can, and uh, how accessible the CSF space is uh, for delivery of the antisense and then distribution uh, throughout the uh, nervous system. Uh, and uh, many people um, will talk about the complexity of a spinal tap, but in fact, it's an ordinary procedure for those of us in clinical neurology. So just by a simple uh, outpatient procedure, we can deliver that. It's uh, in uh, clinical trials that I'm performing um, in and out in less 30, 30 minutes to try to do uh, the administration. Uh, the first um, testing ground for antisense was actually in the field of ALS, and that was originally um, championed by Richard Smith, who was a, a clinical neurologist uh, who had this idea of applying antisense technology to 
one of the other mutations, SOD1. This paper was published in about 2006. Uh, and then the first phase one clinical trial was uh, published in uh, uh, 2013 um, uh, by Tim Miller, who's now at uh, Washington University in St. Louis. Uh, and this was the first in man uh, approach showing uh, safety of administration for antisense for the SOD1 mutation. Uh, this is just the SMA, which is now a, a, was a faster moving story. So this was the uh, approach to trying to uh, force splicing machinery to make the competent protein, and this is now an FDA approved drug. And now we're seeing that uh, uh, this is in uh, development for lots of different directions. We're now um, completing a phase one trial for SOD1. Uh, c 9 rf 72 is about to enter clinical trials probably within the next uh, couple of weeks. Um, myotonic dystrophy and Huntington's disease are two of uh, a number of the other uh, uh, diseases that are being uh, teed up with antisense oligonucleotide therapy. Now, uh, one of the interesting things, I'm just going to end with this uh, part of the story, in C9, as you can imagine, it's going to be a little more complicated in terms of the uh, strategy. And it turns out there's a number of different isoforms of a C9, but one of the uh, important parts is that the, um, the, the one of the isoforms that carries the expansion can be selectively targeted by your antisense to reduce uh, the expansion-carrying uh, allele uh, or isoform, but leave the other isoforms alone. So in fact, what we see, at least in uh, models, is that we can uh, reduce uh, um, the expansion, but really leave the total RNA um, intact so that we, don't, we may be able to get by, even if there is problems from the loss of function from gene reduction, we can still probably get by because most of the functioning C9 uh, protein is going to be intact. But it leaves uh, unanswered the question of whether it's the sense strand or antisense. When we target the sense strand, we can reduce, or, uh, we can reduce the antisense. We can reduce the sense foci but it, we don't do anything for the antisense uh, derived uh, foci. So it still becomes a question if the clinical trials are not um, going to show efficacy, are, is it a problem of lack of efficacy or is it a problem um, because we're targeting the wrong strand? And I think one of the other uh, stories that we're all learning is what uh, Brian was just talking about is it's becoming very clear that the earlier treatment is applied, the more effective the therapies. So much so that in SMA, now they're doing newborn screening with the idea of treating people before they even become symptomatic. And I think that's going to be a big story in neurodegenerations because we can't generally pre-treat our patients because the onset is so variable from um, even within a family. But it's very clear that um, time is going to be um, performance in terms of uh, trying to get an effective therapy. I'll just summarize by saying uh, that come all out. Uh, that C9 is a was a computationally predicted gene until about uh, s uh, seven years ago. The mutations are the most common genetic cause for the uh, diseases. It's a unique kind of a uh, mutation called an expanded repeat. Um, it's suggesting a molecular mechanism, at least in C9, that has to do with the gain of function so that a gene reduction will work. It in, in, inextricably links ALS and FTD at a genetic level. Um, it has a robust uh, protein biomarker that we can use in clinical trials. It's suggesting that ASAO therapy is going to be effective. Uh, and I think ALS, because of the unique progression, uh, unlike compared to some of the other diseases, is going to be a testing ground for proof of principle that ASOs are going to be an effective therapy. So I'm going to stop there, take some questions. I just want to thank the people in my lab and in my collaborators uh, who are working with me on this uh, at UCSD and elsewhere, and the group at uh, Ionis Pharmaceuticals. Thank you very much.
Okay, are there questions? Yeah, I was just uh, curious, how can you target the, the expansion uh, the defective gene but not the wild type and that approach doesn't work for the, you know, the anti-sense Huntington's uh, targeting? Okay, so, um, yeah, so it's in, in C9, which you can do since most of the, since the, the minority of the isoforms are carrying the expansion, you can reduce, you can target that isoform uh, and the other isoforms which, co which are three prime of the expansion, they start three prime of the, they start three prime of the expansion. So those are gonna be uh, spared by the reduction. So you can actually reduce then the mutant carrying. Now it, it's not you're not you're not um, targeting the wild type versus the mutant allele. You're targeting uh, the expansion the versus the non-expansion um, transcript. Huntington's is a different strategy altogether, and there's some SNPs and other approaches that are being used. Okay, can I ask you a related question to that? So how specific are the ASOs? to the uh, GGGCC expansion at the C9 locus. So will other genes also be targeted by the ASO? How specific is this um, going to be? Well, that's going to be something to, to establish. As far as we know, so, uh, so working with Ionis as they're developing this, one of the th things that impressed me is just how systematically they've been in taking ASOs, walking down the gene, First of all, looking to see that there's reduction, and then secondly, looking at the tox tox toxicity of it. So um, the specificity seems to be extremely high, and so off-target effects are not predicted that they're gonna be looked for. Um, I'm not in a position to answer that, to be honest. Uh, uh, I think a lot of it has been uh, with sequencing and looking at uh, other perturbations. The modeling for uh, C9 has been problematic. There's a lot, a lot of different mouse models, um, but they all have flaws. Um, correct. So the question had to do with the uh, how does it get into the cell, and and I I tried showing this. I think I have a slide. I guess it's not showing. It it penetrates. So we know that we when you do uh, look for the antisense in the cell, we see it in the cells. We see it in the neurons. We see it in the motor neurons. How it gets there has actually now become a big frontier of ASO biology, is trying to figure out what are the transport systems and how is it actually doing that. Yeah, in the olden days, we, we thought this was badly inefficient. It's, that this technology has had a transformative change and it clearly gets in. Yeah, it's very impressive. So speaking of transformable uh, change, um, how about CRISPR um, and gene editing? Do you think there's a future for that? In diseases like this? Well, um, I, think, I think what we're going to probably see in, for neurodegenerative diseases is a combination of something like AAV9 delivering in combined with an ASO. So I think uh, uh, it'd be interesting what Brian has to think, but it's, it's going to be a complicated delivery strategy, and I think it's probably going to be a hybrid of, of uh, technologies. But it's not going to be gene editing, like like just editing out that part of the genome? You think um, that's too hard to do? I think it's a long way off. I think, uh, I don't think it's immediately translatable at this point because you've got to get uh, the, uh, the apparatus into the cell before you can start editing it out. Yeah, there's sort of a, I Unless think there's a, there's a very large movement on the part of the CRISPR people to try to solve those problems. I'm just curious if these two are ever gonna converge. Last quick question. Yeah, I'm just curious what the half-life of the ASOs is and how many times you might have to dose over the course of the lifetime. Well, as, the, as it currently stands, it's administered, as I say, intrathecally. It's uh, about a three-month half-life. So in the clinical trials, uh, which we're performing, we're actually doing it monthly administration. Thanks very much, John. Okay.